Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, we have David on to make a special announcement. Uh, he is with the Vermont State Labor Council Executive Board, and he is part of the United Caucus, which is going to be the uh, topic of discussion today because there's uh, some news happening with that. Um, I got a letter put out by the Action Network for uh, it's a petition to Liz Schuler, who is the president of the AFL-CIO. And it's from uh, the Vermont United and Allies uh, of the United Slate for the AFL-CIO. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out the letter that you see on the screen here. And then uh, we're going to have going to have David talk uh, about about this a little more so so we have the context. All right, so, dear President Schuler, I am writing to you because I have concerns about your decision to order a rerun of the Vermont State Labor Council election of its top officers. It has interfered with the momentum of the Vermont State Labor Council's work and sets a troubling precedent for the entire labor union. For the past five years, the Vermont State Labor Council has managed to make tremendous union organizing progress across Vermont and through their rank and file strategy. They have been directly empowering current and future union members by providing them with the tools and information they need to function and organize effectively. They are striving to create a member-run labor movement that is stronger through engagement and is independent from politicians. Their success is also exemplified by the passage of Vermont S-102, the PRO Act, which will give workers in Vermont protections and capabilities. They were also able to get the law passed despite it being halted on a national level. It illustrates the importance of state-run organizing state-level organizing, and the AFL-CIO should be doing what it can to support those movements. Instead, your decision to order a rerun of the Democratic leadership election at their well-attended September convention, as well as other impositions by the national AFL-CIO, has interfered with the Vermont State Labor Council's momentum, diverting resources from their valuable work. The decision to rerun their election is setting a damaging precedent for the entire labor movement. There has been no substantial evidence to establish that the actual vote was affected by how the election was conducted. It is wrong to overturn a rigorously run democratic election that shattered previous partic participation records. Our state labor councils are generally volunteer driven and have limited access to assistance from professor st professional staff. No local election will be perfect. Your decision negatively impacts every rank-and-file member who took time away from their family for a weekend to participate at the convention. It also sets a precedent that any error, however small, could be used to toss out the democratic will of the voters. This could lead to a combination of disengagement of the workers and chaos of endless election challenges in the years to come. Please understand, I send this letter to you because I love the labor movement. I want to continue to build off the organizing success we've had. I had just, I just worry that your decision weakens our movement instead of making it stronger. Thank you for taking the time to read the letter. And if you go to this website, actionnetwork.org, petitions, I'll, I'll include the link. You could find the petition it has 91 signatures and uh, yeah, it would be uh, well, we'll let David talk about that a little more. So thank you, David, for waiting patiently while I read that out. Um, why don't you go ahead and give us some of the context here and why this is such an important situation to be paying attention to right now? Yeah, well, thanks, and thank you for your interest and attention to this. Um, you know, I, I have to sort of think carefully about what I want to say, right, because we want to be very careful to do everything we can to strengthen the labor movement. 
And, you know, the bosses love nothing more than, you know, these inter-labor labor squabbles. Uh, it weakens us. And, of course, you know, it was only with a lot of, of reflection and careful consideration about the pros and cons that we, as a caucus of the Vermont State Labor Council, you know, decided to pursue this counter appeal um, to the decision to overturn the fall election. So, you know, I want really to focus on, first of all, you know, what the United Caucus stands for, what we've done in our leadership of the Vermont State Labor Council, um, and why we think, you know, that work should continue with the approval, the ratification of our of our state members throughout the state um, who elected us in 2019 and then re-elected the slate um, to the executive board in 2021. And then again, this fall in 2023, elected United to a majority of seats on the board as well as all of the um, executive positions. So, you know, broadly speaking, there's a struggle going on now and it's been going on for decades in the U.S. labor movement between, you know, the business unionism model and democratic unionism. And I mean, is this the kind of thing that, that your listeners know all about or should I briefly describe those two strands? I think, you know, it'd be good to describe them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are familiar with the American sure. labor movement uh, so much. So. No, that, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, and it, it is kind of in the shadows. I just didn't know who your listenership is, if this is you know, union focused or not. So mm -hmm. yeah, the business unionism is a term that sort of describes the idea that, that unions are basically like a business and they should have a top-down authority structure, president and officers who are full-time professional union staff um, who earn more generally than the workers that they, that they represent. Um, make decisions largely from the top down, have sort of limited responsiveness to the votes of the rank and file, the will of the rank and file uh, who make up their unions. And, um, and then their focus in terms of action is, is often primarily to lobby politicians the same way that corporations or any other interest groups do. And then democratic unionism, by contrast, uh, first of all, feels that, you know, all union decision-making, whether it's at the locals level or at the level of, like, these enormous umbrella groups like the AFL-CIO, which is made of um, dozens of unions, um, that the decision-making should be as democratic as possible, that the rank-and-file workers should be involved in decision-making at all levels. And then in terms of the actions that we take and our emphasis um, on what we do, uh, democratic unionism feels that, you know, union strength comes from union membership, right? And not just the numbers of members, but their engagement, that they're active members and that they feel involved and engaged in their locals and hopefully in their national unions as well, because, you know, they're listened to democratically. And, you know, that's, that's, I feel as a democratic unionist, you know, that that's the essence of labor power. The, the bosses, the corporations will always have more financial resources. And if your primary political tool is lobbying politicians, that's largely about money, right? I mean, of course we need to have lobbyists if we don't have a voice in the room, <laughs> that's not good. But, um, but the power behind that lobbying comes from the fact that we have hundreds and thousands of union members who, you know, are organized, right? Like that's, that's what being in a union means. You've been organized to act as a, as a group for the interests, the shared interests that you have. So that's a very powerful force that, that politicians really have to reckon with. Um, and we think that by building, you know, worker participation, by increasing the number of locals that exist, and by increasing participation in the locals and in their state and national uh, councils and, and groups, that that's how we're really going to have an influence on on what's going on in this country and in the world. And so um, give us a brief picture of where the American labor movement is at along yeah. that line right, right. now. Well, um, it's interesting because, um, you know, until very recently, the United Auto Workers, which is a very large national union um, with with locals in 
in diverse fields, not just in auto work anymore, but for instance, uh, a num large number of graduate student unions, for instance, in academia are members of UAW. They were until recently a very sort of the epitome of the business union model. And frankly, also quite, you know, corrupt in some very, you know, traditional ways. There were lots of, uh, it, not all of it, you know, fully uh, legally certified, but there, were, there was a lot of, you know, engagement uh, with uh, some unsavory figures and organizations. And then just a, a few years ago, um, there was a reform slate of candidates that ran for the executive board positions. They ran for five seats on the nine member board. They won all five seats. And now the United Auto Workers is controlled by this reformist democratic um, union caucus, which has just completely turned the United Auto Workers around. And now their president, um, Sean Fain, is in the news all over the place, organizing new unions all over the country. He's a political force to be reckoned with politicians and even, even you know, people on the street might recognize his name um, because of the influence that they have. So that's, that's both kinds of, of unionism right there at the national level. In the AFL-CIO, which is you know, a large umbrella group of I think 52 different national unions, um, the AFL-CIO has also been a very top-down organization with a focus on, on business unionism. But there are a number of regional and state labor councils that are sort of, uh, you know, local consolidations of, of unions within their region or state that are members of the AFL-CIO. And there are several regional and state councils that are interested in a more democratic union, unionism approach. And, you know, this in itself is not a terrible problem. Like, you know, if, if our state labor council wants to have this emphasis and it's different from the national emphasis, then, then that's fine, you know, and, and if, if we want to change the direction of the national union, then we need to elect a lot more of our own union presidents to sit on the board of, the, of that organization and, and turn things there. But what's, what's disturbing and what's been going on is that the national leadership of the AFL-CIO has um, not been happy with the fact um, that there are these reformist state and, and local councils and has, you know, in fact been unfortunately doing things to interfere with, um, with our ability to, to do the work that we really, you know, were elected to do, which is to organize workers in our state and to make the workers, the union workers in our state more active and more engaged um, who, who are already organized into unions and to affect policy, you know, at our state level, which, which we've been tremendously successful at. So, you know, maybe before, before, and again, I don't want this to be the emphasis, right? Before I talk about the ways in which we've butted heads with the national AFL-CIO, I want to just, you know, emphasize that this isn't just, you know, a matter of philosophical preference, but we've been, we've been enormously effective. So when we were, when the United Slate was first elected uh, in 2019, it was at a low point in Vermont union participation, uh, about 10% of Vermont workers were unionized, which is about, about where it is nationally. Uh, meanwhile, nationally, it's trickled down since then, since 2019. While in Vermont, we're now, uh, we now have 14% of this labor force in our state, uh, members of unions. And it isn't just something that's happening statewide, it's happening, you know, our, our own membership, um, the affiliations, the number of, of union workers affiliated with in our state labor council has doubled since we um, since we took charge of of the state labor council in 2019, and many new unions have come online. Have many workplaces have been organized in Vermont in that past four years, and that's you know first and foremost due to the hard work of the union, of the workers in those workplaces. But our state labor council has emphasized um, assisting and supporting organization in, in new workplaces. So we've had, you know, we've, we've been in support and we've given important support to all these organizing efforts. And so we've, 
we've had come online and join our council. We've had, um, for instance, the University of Vermont Staff Union, which is one of the maybe the largest local in the no the second largest local in the state after the state employees union, with over a thousand members. Which, <laughs> you know, I don't know your listeners. Vermont is tiny, right? We're we're smaller than a lot of American cities. A thousand workers is a lot. There's only six hundred and something thousand people in the whole state. Uh, and we've also been doing things to engage workers, uh, whether or not they're already in unions. We've established worker circles in three cities in Vermont where people unionized and non-unionized can come together uh, and share information and strategies and um, give each other solidarity for, for the work that they're doing to empower workers. So regardless of your sort of philosophical stance on business unionism, democratic unionism, We've been enormously successful in the most important things that, that unions do, which is organize workers. And that success has translated also into legislative success. So for people who say, well, you know, we need to really focus on lobbying and put our, our monetary resources primarily not into organization but into lobbying. It's like, well, why do you do that? You do that to pass legislation. And we have um, done that in Vermont, right? So we passed, as you mentioned, we passed the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize Act, which has stalled out at the national level, but uh, which, which we passed here um, this past legislative session. And that does things like um, allow for card check union elections, which means that once a majority of workers sign a card at a workplace saying they want to join a union, then the union has to be recognized. Whereas, um, National labor law, as it currently stands, if a majority of workers sign cards saying they want to be in a union, then they get to have an election and start over. And before that election, the employer you know, has the opportunity to educate their workers on the pros and cons of joining a union and right. also has the opportunity to retaliate against union organizers, which is illegal, but there's essentially no penalty for doing so. So... Um, and, and also, just you know, for those of your listeners who don't know, these, these elections, uh, union elections, to determine whether or not a union will be recognized, they're run by the employer at the workplace, right? Which is, even if everything else is on the up and up, is, is a potential form of sort of quiet intimidation. So anyway, we passed the PRO Act here in Vermont, um, which we're very pleased with. And you know, we, we have this demonstrated record of four years of success. However, um, our style, like I said, has rubbed the national AFL-CIO leadership the wrong way. And going back to our very first election in 2019, when we ran this reform slate, um, swept the election. We won all the seats on the board, as well as the treasurer and vice president and president positions. Um, after that election, the national leadership um, ordered a recall of the election, a redo, because of a lot of irregularities at that election. And to be frank, there were a lot of irregularities at that election in 2019, not the one we're talking about now. But, you know, this was an election that was run entirely by our predecessors on the board, one that we had no control over. Um, but we did prevail in, in the rerun, and um, then we were able to get down to the business we wanted to, which was not to solve labor versus labor disputes, but to, to do the organizing work I've been talking about. And so we did that. And then we had another election. We have, we have these statewide conventions and elections every two years. In 2021, we again, um, the United Slate was reelected. I think everybody on the board was either a member of the United Caucus or um, unaffiliated with any caucus. Again, the president, vice president, and treasurer were, were members of our group. And then this past fall, 2023, we had yet another election. And this was a contested election. So there was uh, another slate, another president and vice presidential candidate who had more of a business union angle. And as the board that was in power and that was, you know, because we were the board, we were the ones running the election, we, we were delighted about that because 
you know, contested elections are good. If you win an uncontested election, you don't really know what that means. If you have a contested election and one party, you know, one, one group prevails, then it's like, okay, now we have a mandate from the people that really means something. This is the direction that people chose to pursue. So we welcomed that and there was healthy open debate. Um, everything leading up to the election seemed really great. Because the national leadership has been, you know, frankly suspicious of us from the beginning, we were sort of babysat to a certain degree. There were staffers from the national AFL-CIO attending our, our convention in the fall, which as a convention was a huge success. We had, I think, over 125 delegates, which was um, a record high. We've never had that many people come and attend uh, this two-day convention. And, you know, just for context, in, in past decades, you know, numbers have been in the the tens or maybe 20 delegates attending uh, until, until just these last three conventions. So, so that's all signs of a healthy democracy. And on top of which, as I said, there were national staffers there from the AFL-CIO to make sure everything was on the up and up. We had this election. Uh, again, the United candidates for president and vice president won decisively. The treasurer was unopposed. Um, and the board, the results for the, the elections to the, the board, which we had expanded to make much larger, again, in the spirit of sort of better representation. Uh, the board was mixed. There were people of all stripes on the board, but again, the United Caucus had the, the majority. And, you know, there were no concerns expressed by the monitoring staffers who were present at the convention. However, the, the losing candidate for president filed uh, an election complaint. Um, the national, many, many months later, um, decided that this complaint had merit. In the meantime, we, we had, as, as is you know, directed by our constitution, we, we had our own elections committee investigate the complaint. Um, and we had a, a board meeting in December where the board overwhelmingly agreed with the election committee report that, that the election was as good an election as we've ever had. Um, you know, it's, it's a volunteer organization running a volunteer election, but uh, there were a few minor imperfections, but uh, even if everything had gone completely in the favor of the other candidate, it wouldn't have changed the result. We concluded, and the board overwhelmingly um, voted to accept this result, including the members of the board that were affiliated with the, the complaining candidate who, um, who lost. So that was where it was. And then months later, the national leadership um, reversed this decision um, and said that no, the election was invalid um, because of a lot of technicalities that we had already found would not have changed the result. Um, and now is ordering this, this, this second election. So what is the urgency on uh, responding to this? When are, when are they thinking? Mm -hmm. Well, when it's, does interesting. The, yeah. it's interesting because, you know, in, in the initial notification we got from President Schuler, she said that we, the United you know, both the, the Vermont State Labor Council, we had the right to appeal the decision to rerun the election, which of course we did. It's in the national constitution of the AFL-CIO. Um, but she said, however, the, the rerun election would take place nonetheless in the meantime, um, while they considered an appeal, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but that was what, what she decided. Um, and, However, we, we at that point decided to, um, to ex express our concerns in a, a counter appeal. And to our surprise, the, the pre President Schuler said, well, we're going to pause the rerun election while we consider your appeal, contrary mm -hmm. to what she has said before. And, and honestly, I think that that is because we did what we do best, which is organize, and we, um, we with some misgivings, but we, we, we made public our concerns about the process and about what was happening. 
and how it violated our and the national constitution in some ways in, in our understanding. And uh, so I think, you know, as with everything, people power, uh, pressure from large numbers of people, and the awareness that, you know, perhaps the circumstances that led to this decision to redo the election were not, were not very robust and would be embarrassing to have um, really publicly discussed. So, so now they're going, the, the national board is going to reconsider whether there's going to be a rerun election while they hear um, from us and from other parties at, at the appeal. Um, however, you know, they could still decide to have the rerun election. And our concern now to get as much support as we can is that we don't think this rerun election should take place for, for the reasons that you said in the letter. Nothing in the election would have changed the outcome had we done things, had we changed the things that they thought we didn't do right, which mm. we dispute. But even had, they, had we done them, that would not have changed the outcome. And, you know, the, the result is that if, if anybody simply says, I think that this might have been a problem, if they're going to say that that's valid grounds for redoing the election, that... I mean, it's very concerning. It's, it's, it seems, I, I hate to put the labor movement in the same camp as the Republican Party, because we're usually standing at opposite ends of things, but it's really quite Trumpian. It's, it's yeah, an yeah. election denialism that unfortunately has sort of become mainstream. And uh, we're very concerned about the implications um, for, you know, at the ability of any group that gets elected or any person that gets elected to just effectively um, do their work. So what's the big takeaway for workers outside Vermont uh, about this? And what are, what, how can we help? Right. Well, I mean, if you think that, you know, the, the workers should be able to decide who is in charge of their locals and their regional councils and their national leadership by direct participation in, you know, free and open constitutionally legitimate election processes um, and should be free of interference um, based on, you know, differences of, of union philosophy from leadership, then, then I think, you know, it's, it, then you're on our team. And we feel that um, it would be good if the national leadership heard this from as many people as possible, in particular from union members, um, regardless of what that union affiliation is. So, so yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing attention to this and sharing our petition. And I, I would encourage people to, to go to the link and read the details. And if they feel um, that it makes sense to, to add their names, which will then go to the AFL-CIO leadership and let them know, you know, not just that our arguments are solid, but that people are noticing and we need to you know, if we want to have effective labor movement in this country, we need to empower workers. And that means more than just having them pay their union dues, right? It means engaging them in worker democracy in their workplace and in their national unions. Well, I'm happy to be able to help out as much as I can. I want to keep this uh, as short, you know, wrap this up so that people are more likely to watch it. Sure. Uh, you know, usually if I go on for an hour or two, you know, the, the views are going to drop significantly. So let's, I think, uh, I think we're getting this out there now. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about it. Well, I appreciate you having me. All right. Thanks, David. I'm going to end the recording and, uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thanks a lot.